Hey Fiber Friends, it's good to see you again. If you're brand new, my name is Emily and I love all things wool. I love sewing, spinning, knitting, and just kind of general fiber craft. Uh, the video I have for you today is footage I recorded probably in May and June. And then I was not able to record until now. Um, and I had actually had this, these bits waiting um, in my phone, in iMovie, but never published them. And I'm still not sure I'm going to publish them. Uh, it has been a very strange time for, um, well, it's been a strange time. From my perspective, and the reason that I have not been on YouTube or even Instagram very much in the past maybe six weeks, um, is pretty complex. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been doing this since 2012 and I really do value this community and the people that I've been able to connect with here. So it's also a valuable resource for me in terms of a record of what I do and make. And I refer to videos frequently to be like, kind of needle did I use for that sweater or where did I buy that yarn um, like what festival for example so it's not something I want to let go of and like I said I didn't foresee not recording but the complexity of things meant that I didn't record for ages since April May and it's August 21st or 2nd 2020 I usually say that at the beginning, but I'm very out of practice here. So I'm on my porch. It's August 20 whatever, 2020. And yeah, I just wanted to, there's a crow saying hello. I just wanted to come in and say hello as well. Uh, I have been working a ton this summer, which is one reason I haven't recorded. Um, summer is always my busy time. And um, I'm an early intervention speech language pathologist. So I am in people's homes, multiple homes a day. I'm sitting on their floors and playing with their children and showing them how to play with their children and teach their children, their babies essentially. Um, and dealing with all areas of development, not just speech and language. So. All of that work had to go online, and since we use a parent coaching model, when it goes well online, it goes well, and it's very um, apt to go well. So I was able to really bump up my caseload, and since I wasn't driving around, uh, the county was able to see many more people per day than I would have been able to otherwise if we had been seeing families in person. So that meant that after a while, I started getting screen fatigue, like crazy, um, tension headaches. Like I had migraines. I'm not prone to migraines, but I had migraines um, just from shaky cameras, um, trying to watch, leaning into here, um, and just had screen overload. And I couldn't fathom doing something else that relied on the screen. Um, I was able to take a two week vacation and even in that space was not able to have the bandwidth to record. Um, and then, you know, we're navigating everything else that's going on in the world. My family is going through, uh, I hope your family is well and adapting. I think that's the thing, adapting. And as for the rest, was a time where I didn't have much of my knitting mojo and there was a time when I cast on everything and inevitably when you do that things go very slowly but then you kind of start finishing lots of things so that's kind of where I am um, I finished my Bressa I, fin I started and finished a Vertices Unite in 10 days and I will show you these things eventually if I decide to publish this um, I've been sewing quite a bit, 
and I'm about to get going again on some sewing projects. I wove something. I sewed some underpants. I sewed like seven pairs of underpants with knit scrap leftovers. I've sewn so many masks. So many masks. And I went down a new YouTube rabbit hole, which is completely the fault of Sarah Hunt of Fibertrack. Completely her her <laughs> her doing. And so I have adopted a beginner mindset. Alice is at the door. I'm sure she wants to say hello. A beginner mindset, wide-eyed wonder when approaching beauty YouTube. And Sarah did get me started. And there is a link there between the knitting world and beauty YouTube. Uh, and that is Michelle Wong. Did you know the, the amazing designer who used to design for Brooklyn Tweed? She no longer designs for knitwear. She is a beauty YouTuber. And she comes from an arts background, so it kind of makes sense. You know, she admitted, oh gosh, I think my son's playing the drums now. It's another reason I haven't recorded. Everybody's home all the time. There's no, there's no solitude. I've struggled with that. And also it's hard to record a podcast when people are listening in. It's just awkward. Anyway, back to Michelle Wong. She is, she has over a hundred thousand subscribers and she reviews luxury beauty products. Never in a million years would I have thought that I would find this so fascinating, but there are hundreds, thousands of people who do this on YouTube. And the other, it's kind of an offshoot of my work now because I see myself on a screen for seven hours a day, maybe. Hopefully not that many, that's a lot. Ugh. Seven, six, five to seven hours a day. And man, that was the impetus for wearing some makeup. Typically, I'm just kind of, I feel, I feel good in my body in general, and I'm happy to be out in the world, just not, just not looking at myself all the time. Like, I do a quick lip, I can put on some lipstick, whatever, some concealer. But I've really been enjoying it from a, you know, a skin, par skin care perspective, and then and the arts, kind of the color part of it is very fun, and it does have that link to um, to the arts in terms of color and blending and brushes and uh, yeah yeah so it's kind of it's interesting it's fun um, never in a million years would have thought that I'd be interested in trying different makeups but I am no apologies I almost feel like I should tell you what I'm wearing now like beauty youtubers do but no um, I don't wear makeup every day, but I enjoy putting it on and it's a little pause and it's self care and it's sensory and, um, you know, touch, smell, sight, hopefully not taste. I'm not eating it. Anyway, I digress. I digress a lot. Welcome back. So if I feel like it, I will pop this in the beginning of this video and I will show you what I was doing before I stopped recording. And really, I don't think I recorded a damn thing in July or up until now in August. So I do have new projects to show you besides the things you're going to see today, but um, that will have to come later. And I do hope I see you later. And um, until I do see you, take care.
fabric on the bias, especially loosely woven fabrics like linen. It's a bit of a mess. And I have a solution that I love. So this is some just combing waste. This is some hog island I just don't want to use. So it really cleans up remarkably and stays on the wool. That's Sharpie. This can't get Sharpie out. Pretty awesome. And this will just go in here. It'll stuff my next poop. Separated. This, this year. So I have organized my fabric. Not my yarn, but my fabric. And I should have done a before and after because, oh my goodness, these two shelves were packed full of rolled up bits of, uh, well, lengths really of fabric. And I thought this, um, that they would take up less space if I did them this way. And they really, I had to cram them in at the end. <laughs> but let me show you what I have. So I have my quilted... Jacquard quilted Merchant and Mills cotton. I have some Japanese cross hatch non stretch denim. I'm going to make some lander pants out of that. This was a sale of um, on fabric fabric dash store.com of black linen, and I've made an apron out of this already. This is three yards of Joanne's linen. Um, you know, and I should say, <laughs> I could go on and on and on about where I got all these things. Um, and these are a lot of, um, this is denim scraps and these are leftovers that might be enough for camisoles and that's some leftovers. And then these are cottons and then my silks, oh, my silks. So this really allows me to see what I've got just in a really stunning way and kind of allows me to see the color story going on. Anyway, um, I used the True Bias um, tutorial online. Just look up, if you Google True Bias fabric storage, you will find all this stuff. You will find exactly how to do this. And it involves getting two things, which I didn't have, which were alligator clips and magazine board. So you fold your fabric around the magazine board in a certain way, and then you sort of you fold it up like that. And then you clip it. Let's see if I can show you briefly. Um, oh goodness, you can see one of the clips back there. You clip it with those alligator clips. And then you've got like a little bookshelf of your fabrics. So what I've done before I folded each length is I measured the width of the fabric and I measured the yardage so that, and then I tucked that piece of um, information into each fabric so I can just find where 
basically where the clips are. I can stick my hand in there. And I have one and a half yards of wool from Couture, Carlisle, Montreal. It's 58 inches wide. I even put the year on that one. I should have gotten two yards, but that was expensive. And I think it's enough for a cocoa jacket from so over at London. Uh, yeah. So just really thrilled. I think these um, denim scraps will someday be some sort of skirt or jacket. And as I said, camisoles and then the rest. This is not all of my fabric, but it is the lion's share. And the rest that I have is um, sort of scraps, well, failed makes. <laughs> I call that my failed makes shelf. And I do eventually find uses for a lot of that. And I, I want to start making underpants. Batting. Oh gosh, what else is in there? Batting and uh, interfacings. My failed wool jacket, hand spun wool, Icelandic. And my failed Kelly Anorak, which I may come back to at some point. These are wovens that I want to use hand wovens mostly, as well as some tickings and that sort of thing. And down here I have uh, scraps that are useful for masks, as well as my botanically dyed silks up here. Um, botanically dyed wools are right there. Now the this is a bag of fabric scraps, just that are of not a useful size as well as an old kid's bathrobe that I'm going to cut up and turn into kitchen kitchen towels, just claw, like cleaning cloths. And um, it's really good terry cloth. So these are all my knitted scraps and, or sorry, knit fabric scraps and ribbings, as well as fabric that I want to make into a closet case poof. What else do I have? Is that it for fabric? I think that is enough my friends so yeah there's my my bookshelf I even have an empty empty spot right there where I took some magazine storage out um, and I might go through those and declutter but yeah I'm quite thrilled with that quite thrilled hello hello I have something to show you. It's the closet case poof. It's massive. I think it weighs about 50 pounds. It is stuffed with all of the leftovers that I had. I thought I had a lot of leftovers, but then I had to stuff this poof and I think I could have even gotten more in there. So this is from the closet case blog. It is a free pattern. They just put poof in there. I have it in our family room. It's a great little footstool. And I'd love to make more, but I don't have st stuffing. <laughs> I basically have to work up to enough stuffing. You could put old clothes in here. You could put, I don't know, random household bits that are soft enough to stuff a poof. So I am going to turn this camera around and show you all the details. It was kind of fun to make. I was surprised. I did piping for the first time. There's an invisible zipper on the bottom. So, and it's all scrap fabrics with the exception of maybe one. So, oh, Alice, want, Alice, you want to say hi? Look, you want to come up? I don't think she's come up here yet. Do you want to come up, princess? I know they're outside. You want, anyway, let me turn you around. Maybe I'll get Alice in the picture too. I am wearing my Wilder gown top. I really enjoy this thing and I think I want to make a full length. Yeah, there you go. Come on. A full length wilder gown because I'm just at home I'm working at home so I can wear whatever I want as long as it looks good from here up all right Miss Princess there you go sit down sit 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 sit, sit. oh yes you're very pretty there you stay oh you're cool you stay can you shake that's a very good girl all right let's show them the details shall we show them the details look over there well, I'll show them the details. Okay, you're gonna get off now? Okay. I love this dog so much. 
So she's decided she's not going to get off, but let me show you the poof. Look at this gorgeousness. So I have some Indian Kalamkari. I have this, which is kind of, okay, I'm gonna get my hand kissed now. Kind of an upholstery fabric that I had yardage for and I never used it for anything, but it's perfect here. And I actually have this on the bottom as well. You need to move now. Some corduroy, ooh, excuse me, some corduroy. Really pretty stretch, is it stretch corduroy? It might be. Um, this and this one are in the same line. It's hand spun something. And then this is twill, leftover twill for my Morgan jeans. There's so much stuffing in this poof. Now the poof is supposed to come, all the points are supposed to meet in the middle, but I don't do that kind of quilting precision. And this is just fine the way it is. I could put a big button. I could do that someday. That might be fun. But I'm pretty darn proud of this piping. I used double gauze that has this, these metallic spots. That was a new technique and I enjoyed it. So it has piping on the top and it has piping on the bottom. So the bottom is this um, sort of jackety upholstery fabric. And there's an invisible zipper. So I put most of the scraps inside an old sheer curtain that was from my kids' room when they were babies. It had stars on it and they just didn't, didn't want it in the room anymore, but I still had it. They were decent quality and they got use for 16, 17 years, so not bad. But um, yeah, most of it is in that bag and sort of cinched up. I did a long a basting stitch and put everything in there and gathered it up like a pouch. And that is just so that you can take the scraps out in one sort of piece, one mass of scrap fabric, uh, so that you can wash the exterior. I hope I don't have to wash the exterior. Probably wasn't good having the dog sit on there, but anyway, I decided to have the side panels match the top, and I did a pretty darn good job. There's occasionally, why do we always have to show where it didn't work out right? But anyway, it's an impulse we have. It's okay um, to show it, I think. And I love it. I can't believe I made it. And I, as I said, I want more, but I need to gather up the scraps. Okay. I hope y'all enjoyed. I certainly did. Alice, did you enjoy it? Yeah, she did. All right, so that's a little bit show you and I'm off to celebrate my dad's birthday. He's turning 76. Hope you all are well. Hey folks, I have a little bundle of hand spun samples I thought I'd talk about with y'all. This, these are not washed. You can see they're still kind of spirally, I have some extra twists, they're not relaxed. And holy smokes, my nails are painted. Of course, they're chipped. But, you know, a little extra time in quarantine. I remember that I actually have nail polish around my house. And yeah, there it is. Okay, so let me show you these. I have also brought along some locks. <laughs> However, I'm missing one of the locks. I don't know where I put this little bundle of wool. But anyway, let me show you what I've got. I want to talk about this one first. This is Hog Island. And look at that short staple. Oh my goodness, this is clean-ish. Um, that really doesn't come out till you process it. Um, yeah, so it's got this very, I'm gonna take it over here. <clears throat> my, my new green linen pants. So yeah, that is two knuckles worth of fleece. An inch and a half maybe? And this is a two ply. So this is not quite as, it was pretty spongy, but not perhaps as spongy as previous Hog Islands. So this one came from a farm. I have the paper here. Let's see. Can I open it? There we go. So not coated. Hog Island from Rockledge Farms in Pennsylvania. Buttermilk Road. I paid $15 a pound for this. I just like Hog Island. I like the story. I like experimenting, seeing how it um, 
manifests in different places. All right, so that's Hog Island. Not sure. I think I'll probably, I don't know what I'll do with the rest of it. We'll see. Um, okay, this one. This one is a Perindale cross. It is a yearling. Here is the paperwork here. Um, this is a Perindale cross with Cheviot. It's Sally. So this was her yearling cross. I think that's also called a hogget. This is what the lock looks like. This is an excellent fleece. You can see there's a little second cut, but it's a really well done fleece generally. Um, and I've been playing with it quite a bunch. Sorry about my awesome camera work doing this left-handed. So yeah, gorgeous length here. So again, this was the length of the Hog Island. This is almost three times that. Really beautiful. It's about three and a half to four inches. I see this as some sort of two-ply lace shawl project. So this might be the next fleece I process in its entirety. Really beautiful. I see it combed. Um, really enjoying that one. Perindale crossed with Cheviot. I think that's a Maryland. Is it a Maryland or Virginia farm? Perindale and Cheviot. Lucky Lane Farm. And can tell you possibly I have to look it up I don't think oh wait there's a card in here they are from I'm sorry Whitehall Maryland now this one is some um, oh gosh a breed I've never tried this is Florida cracker and this is the the wool that I can't find um I have some comb, some washed locks somewhere. I don't know where I put them. But wow, is this tricky to deal with. Um, this is one of those critically, critically endangered breeds. Very few sheep left. I don't have the details on how many, but the Ross Farm is has taken some of these sheep in and um, they offer some raw wool. Now you see all this stuff in here? It is really soft, actually. I wish I could show you the lock. The locks are very, um, oh gosh, how should I describe them? Really should have thought of my words before I started talking about this. Very, I wanna say scattered. That's not really right. Um, what is, let's see about, there's not a ton of elasticity. I feel like there's, they remind me of Shetland, some types of Shetland. The Shetland where there's very little crimp and it's kind of like a puff of hair and that's what Florida Cracker reminds me of. So it does retain, it looks like some of those primitive characteristics because the primitive part of the Shetland fleeces is, is like that. But very soft. Um, however, the tips on this particular fleece, that's actually a tip right there. They it's a tippy fleece. It just comes right off. So in order to um, really have a smooth, there's another one right there, a smooth yarn, you're going to have to pluck off every broken tip. So that's hair and not hair, that's wool plus whatever is in there. <laughs> but yeah, the, so yeah, it's not really been bred to produce excellent wool. It's just been kind of left to its own devices. There's some more right there. See that? Tippy. So I decided just to see what happened. I'm a big fan of seeing what happens. <laughs> this is what happens. I didn't pull out the tips. I thought maybe they'd come out in the processing, but not all of them. A significant amount are still in there. Well, I will say um, it's not a uniform crimp. I think that's the word I was looking for. Not a uniform fleece, again, to be expected, to be expected, but really lovely to get my hands on some of this. And um, I've sent the remainder off to another curious wool person um, to be played with. Now this one, oh gosh, let me get this off of my leg. You've seen, this is my sewing table. Goodness, old mess of cords right here. 
and one of the fig trees and down here an alkanet anyway let's focus on the wool this was a very interesting little spin of romney from solitude this is moose this is moose's fleece look at this i just grabbed a handful and it's really i'm not doing moose any favors but moose you can just flick moose moose's locks open and spin right from them no combing needed no carding needed i am going to comb and card eventually but these were just this was spun from the lock it is a stunning fleece oh moose 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 you're gorgeous. Look at that. Um, and this down here is just a tie. But really spins itself. So soft. Lovely and glossy. I don't know if you can see. Like This is more the color. Um, a two-ply. I think this wants to be a three-ply. It's so light, though. Goodness. I'm going to play around with mousse. I have four pounds. I'm kind of in love. In love, in love, in love. I don't know if you can see the shine there so yes the tips are a tan color but it has not affected the look of the yarn at all really really in love and I want to think carefully about what I want to do with this fleece mm, I just want to give it a kiss right now so again here they are Romney from Solitude Perindale yearling Perindale cross with Cheviot Hog Island from Maryland, and Florida Cracker from Pennsylvania. And you might be wondering, what is this gorgeousness? My beautiful friend Sarah is an amazing needlewoman, and she sent me this. And I, I have it here just so I can look at it. I need to find a place for it. She made me a manatee as well. I love manatees. I'm I, I hesitate to say obsessed because... It's not a word I would use lightly. I think it's overused, but I'm drawn to them. So I hope you enjoyed that little look through my wooly samples. Aren't they pretty? I will probably use these to test some natural dye samples. Mm -hmm.